ask it to go ahead and create an object model for me from my virtual database. This is just using stock settings here from Hibernate. This will just take a second. It's basically going through the metadata, determining primary key, foreign key relationships, all the things that you need to know to build your Hibernate entity model. Once that's done, um, now I have my classes and mappings that represent my integration database. Make sure that those guys are built. Now I can drop in here and I can see that now I do indeed have a persistent object uh, account. Uh, I should ask the Hibernate tools guys the question, but I'm not sure why I ended up with an uppercase package name and a lowercase class name, but you know, bear with me for one moment. I can then use this Again, just as any kind of Hibernate entity model, say from account. Now here are all my account objects. They have already a relationship with customer, customer has accounts, so on and so forth. And I can go to my integration layer and do the same thing. Now here are all my customer accounts. So this is Hibernate not only pulling information from Derby, this is Hibernate inter integrating Derby and text data together, but it could just as easily be web service, another database, et cetera. Um, let's see. I, at this point, it's, it's probably good just to open up to questions. Um, Anything on the top of anyone's mind? Oh, oh. So the question is: is um, to util to utilize TID with Hibernate? Do you still need uh, the XML mapping files? No, no that, that's just the the generation settings here for Hibernate tools. Um, you, you just would change the, the generation settings, or you know you can certainly make your entity model by hand. Um, the, the idea is that TIAD then is just a JDBC source. Our embedded kit comes with the Hibernate dialect that you would want to use, and then everything just works seamlessly from there. Uh, even for writes, so our, our view layers um, are uh, bi-directional. Uh, anytime you want to do an insert, update, delete, we give you the ability to um, define uh, a procedure to perform that operation. So if I go into accounts view, customer accounts, I can say this, this view itself supports update. And I can define procedures that tell me how to how to actually break down that update statement into the constituent updates that you want to perform against each of your sources. Um, then our runtime engine itself is integrated with uh, JBoss uh, transactions so that all this is coordinated through an XA transaction um, that's either has a uh, local scope or could be from a global scope from your application. Yeah, it's the, the, so the question is, will... If, if you do not have a primary key, then your usage model with Hibernate is already a little substandard because, you know, Hibernate wants entities to have identity. Um, and that's for caching, that's for, you know, for a whole lot of reasons. Uh, Meta Matrix by itself doesn't need to enforce that relations have primary keys, but if you are integrating with, with Hibernate, uh, just as we've done in this example, um, you'll notice that the, the tables all have been marked as having, uh, for example, customer account primary key, 
and appropriate foreign key relationships. But there's, there's nothing that in, in our world um, that says you, you need to have them. I can just lob that key off. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the question is, is uh, if, I, if the text file that's being used as a source is edited, will it be picked up immediately? And, and the answer to that is yes, just because of how the text connector has been written. Uh, the, the text connector is actually looking at a, an, a file that gives you where the, the data files themselves are at. So if we look at this uh, market data definition file, it's saying that the price tables location is in the market data dash price text file. Uh, it tells you what the delimiter is here, the header line, so on and so forth. It's just that this kind of uh, metadata file will be uh, or can be generated as part of our import process. Uh, but now if, if you at uh, runtime here go in to samples, portfolio, into the market data price file, we can certainly add a new entry here. Um, or let's see. We'll be optimistic. Now I should be able to switch over to my designer view here. We'll choose. Looks like the perspective switch is getting a little Harry here, but we'll instead go to Hibernates. That's going to affect the market data price in an HQL editor. So there's my Red Hat $100 a share. So the question is, if a human is the one making these edits, just as I did, and I make a mistake, is there any kind of validation uh, that, that we're going to be performing? The answer is part of TID, no. Um, you will get an appropriate exception at runtime saying, you know, we tried to load this using the delimiter that you told us to, and all of a sudden now we've come across something we don't understand. You know, you'll get a nice error message. But as far as a proactive validation, no, we're, we're not going to do that or currently do that. Yeah, that, uh, so the, the comment is about, uh, suppose there is caching being utilized on top of this. And so um, in our world, we do have a materialization feature. Um, we also do have uh, results at caching uh, at both the connector layer, user query layer. Um, suppose if you make a mistake in one of your sources that you, you don't necessarily want to purge that cache or have it updated based upon what is invalid. Um, in the case of materialization, the way that works right now, um, it, uh, and let me preface this by saying that's actually not available yet, that's a 6.2 feature that would, that would be made available, is that the user is in control of the refresh. So it'll be up to them to say, okay, I think everything is good, let me, let me do a refresh in my materialization tables. Well, thank you everyone for uh, learning more about you.